So we're now jumping into the concept of body composition. So that really tells us what is our body made up of. So it's made up of percent fat, water, bone, muscle, skin, and other lean tissues overall. And we can measure your body composition. Now, the gold standard is the DEXA scan, and that's a this massive x-ray machine, and it costs a lot of money, but it's quite accurate. But we also have these other scales called bioelectrical impedance analysis scales, and we have quite a few of them at the clinic. We've tried a bunch. We've compared them. I've done a DEXA scan myself, and I compared it to the results of some of these BI scales and we found that the, the most accurate one we've been using for our patients. So it's important that body composition is used as, as a measure as opposed to just weight alone because we can take a look at this example. Two people can weigh the exact same but have very different wellness and fitness needs because of their body compositions and it's really dependent on were you previously very active? Are you continuing to be very active? Do you engage in a lot of weight or resistance training? Do you have a lot of muscle mass? And so we see on the right hand side in this figure that the person on the left um, and the right actually they weigh the exact same but the person on the left has a 35 percent body fat and only 20 percent muscle and they're a sedentary person whereas a bodybuilder to the right has five percent body fat and is 70 percent muscle so while this is quite a drastic comparison and that might not be as relevant to some of us it's important that we still see that there are these minor tweaks in, in the sense of we might not be getting the full picture just by looking at your weight alone. And so we at this at our clinic like to take a look at your body composition. And we have 13 metabolic outcomes with the scale. And we look at all of that and assess, you know, what are we seeing on your visceral fat, your subcutaneous fat? What's your muscle mass in pounds? What about the ratio compared to your fat? How can we work on changing these values? And are you on your road to success as you come in and we check you at the baseline or one month taking the medication four months in? Are we seeing the progress that we want to see? So it's an excellent tool. These scales, you can buy them online. The one that we use is the Fit Index scale. You can get it on Amazon for thirty dollars, and it's a it's a small price to pay to, to get a great idea of where you are with your health. And I think over here um, we are just looking at uh, a table to the right that shows you the different body fat uh, percentages and what's necessary. So the essential fat we need on our bodies um, is different for women and men. And so that's why we have this, uh, this table here to show you. So it's 10 to 13% for women and two to 5% for men. And so athletes typically have a, a body fat percentage of, of 14 to 20% as, as women and six to 13 for men. Then when we go up to the fitness level, it's around 21 to 24% for women and 14 to 17% for men. Now let's take a look at Dr. Kearney's body composition. He it's kindly allowed us to look at these uh, values here, and he's been using the Fit Index scale over time to, to measure his outcomes. And here are the main nine that we see. Um, so we're seeing his weight, his BMI, his body fat, um, his visceral fat looks good. That that's a, it's a great sign, Dr. Kernu is within the green range. Um, and I know Dr. Kernu always talks about he's still walking really hard to reduce those those fat values and increase that muscle mass. But we can even see he's at 50% uh, skeletal muscle. You're on an incredible track. <laughs> so I got a ways to go. You can see I have um, too much fat, not enough muscle. But I find this very motivating to myself. Um, and I hope you find this motivating to yourself too as well, because my blood sugar is too high um, and I need to do something about that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get 10 pounds of fat off and gain 10 pounds of muscle on. So that's my goal. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to use this scale to help us. I'm not sure how many times it's going to take, but I'm just going to keep doing it and enjoy the journey. Um, skeletal muscle is a crucial tissue for maintaining blood glucose control and energy balance. So lean mass on your body, so that would be your bone density, but specifically your muscle mass is positively associated with reduced incidence of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, a reduced group of risk factors for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Um, so it really reduces your fasting glucose levels, your triglyceride levels, um, it helps with managing hypertension, and then again, obesity and, and, and treating reduced HDL as well. So how is your body composition changing on Ozempic? We looked at patients who stayed on the lowest dose of Ozempic, so 0.25 milligrams for four months. And we found that in that time, on average, they lost around seven pounds, with the first six pounds being in the first month. So we can see that lowering effect of that lowest dose in the first month. You lose a lot in the first month, and in the next three months, it kind of tapers off. We also looked at muscle mass. I found that lean body mass was decreasing as well, and that loss was shown to be increased in higher doses as well. So while some lean body mass is to be expect like lean body mass loss is to be expected with weight loss, especially weight loss that is rapid, it's important to make efforts to mitigate this loss. And interestingly, um, when I separated the patients into the respective classes of obesity, we found that patients with a higher BMI, so a higher class of obesity, specifically class three obesity, actually maintained or even gained a little bit of muscle, a range of zero to two pounds compared to those of class one. 
um, obesity, which lost anywhere from zero to four pounds of muscle in those four months. So it really emphasizes that depending on your, your obesity class, it can have different effects on you as well. But it, overall, just this study kind of goes to show that we need to take efforts and measures to reduce the lean body mass loss. And there are ways of, of making it, making sure that we are losing that body fat. And it shows that it's been effective for our patients here at the clinic. That's actually very important. So for instance, if I were to go on Ozempic now, I run the risk of losing, so I have some, I still have some fat to lose, but I don't have a huge amount. So therefore I have the risk of losing more muscle mass. And, and so I don't want to use Ozempic at this point in time. I might use it intermittently when I get stuck along the way, or I'm having a bad time, I gain five pounds and I'm going through a, a challenging time. But if you're really overweight, that's the magic of Ozempic because you're already doing resistance training. You're carrying a big body and you're training your muscles. And, and so therefore, you're going to, if you have a lot of fat to lose, you're going to lose a lot more fat. If you don't have that much fat to lose, you run the risk of losing more muscle. So that's important. So this is not a cosmetic drug to get to that, you know, that last 10 pounds, I look good in whatever clothes or, or whatever you want. This is a drug for a serious medical condition, overweight kills, and at least so, so many medical problems from heart disease to stroke, diabetes, depression, arthritis, Alzheimer's disease, you can go on and on and on, many cancers. So this is not a drug for the last little bit. It's a drug for to really help you change your life to the right person. And uh, thank you for pointing that out and thank you for showing that information. So the dose you use, you lose more the higher dose. And the more fat you need to lose, uh, the more likely the drug will be successful to you. But if you're not prepared to drive the car or do the work, good luck. Um, but I found for so many people who were stuck, it got them unstuck, it made a huge difference. It changed their lives. Absolutely. So what can we do about this, specifically the lean body mass loss? Um, so if we just click a slide again, um, inactive adults experience a three to 8% loss of muscle mass per decade. Um, so 10 weeks of resistance training can increase lean weight by 1.4 kilograms, increasing your resting metabolic rate by 7% and reduce fat weight by 1.8 kilograms. Yeah. So benefits are improved physical performance, movement control, walking speed, functional independence, cognitive abilities, and self-esteem. It can even assist in prevention and management of type 2 diabetes by decreasing visceral fat, reducing your hemoglobin A1C levels, and it may even enhance your cardiovascular health by reducing your blood pressure, decreasing your LDL cholesterol and triglycerides, and increasing high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. And even beyond this, we can see functional changes. Dr. Kronu recently highlighted to me that on the fragility scale, even as we think about when we age, um, you're at higher risk of fractures in your hips and, and damaging those things. And as we, as we age, that's, that comes with that. But if we're doing that resistance training and strengthening our muscles, we're, we're lowering our chances of, of damaging our bodies even more, even in situations that we might not have control in. And we're creating these preventive factors, uh, pr protective factors for ourselves. So it's interesting. A young person's fracture is you fall and you break your wrist. You put your wrist out, you stop the fall. And my wife will never let me forget this. We went bike riding. We had a little collision and she fell, broke her wrist. I made her drive the car home. I didn't think it was broken. Um, but an old person's fracture is your hip. You fall, you can't catch yourself. You break your hip. And if you fall, break your hip over the age of 65 years of age, you have between a 10 to about a 30% one to two year mortality. Up to 50% of people will pass away in the next few years after a hip fracture. Um, and very, you know, only a, a small percentage gets back to their normal self afterwards. Um, so to me, is that building muscle is important. Um, so pl please get, tell us more about this. So build muscle. So how can we increase our muscle mass? Let's take a look. Um, we can see that uh, resistance training has been shown to induce great benefits in, in all populations, including those at retirement age. So this study uh, to the right found that at the four-year assessment, after completing either a year of heavy resistance training, moderate training, or no training at all, that one year of heavy resistance training could induce long-lasting beneficial effects by preserving your muscle function up to four years later. And we'll see on the next slide, Dr. Kernew um, working really hard. He does a lot of resistance training and he really does practice what he preaches. Come join um, us on Mondays and Wednesdays between six and seven at the Dundas Physio on Hyatt Street there. They beat the hell out of you. Uh, <laughs> and the best money I spent. And then uh, I think Darren, he's my squash buddy. In between squash games, we do all sorts of different things. And uh, it's, uh, it's um, but I still have a long ways to go. I, you know, my body composition is too much fat, not enough muscle. I will keep working at it. I'm getting better. I just wish I started early. So the earlier you start, the better off you are. It's never too late. There's good data in people who are 80 years of age who do this. They build more muscle. Mm -hmm.